Welcome to the EW Podcast. I'm your host, Eric White, and today I have the distinct pleasure of being joined once again by John D. Russell. John D. Russell is a professional photographer, philanthropist, and the founder of the photo expedition organization Perspective. He was also the first guest on this podcast, and he's back for number 50. Thanks, dude. Wow, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm super stoked to have you on. I know, you know, we were just talking before recording and I went back and listened to the first conversation before we hopped on and it was really good, dude. I feel like we covered some good ground and you had so many good nuggets, like good takeaways that it just made me even more stoked to do this conversation, which we had planned. Yeah, that was was good. It's great that you're uh, coming full circle and it's great to be back. Yeah, man, for sure. So professional photographer, maybe let's just start off in the now and then get a little more abstract and into the past and stuff. How has it been like to run a photography business during COVID lockdowns? Uh, Yeah, it was uh, extremely challenging. Uh, My photography business, like many others, was pretty much shuttered. Um, with the mandatory lockdown. So uh, it was it was a tough go, but um, I was able to pivot my business a bit and uh, still work uh, through the pandemic, which was was awesome. And I'm super thankful for you know the clients that I do have that um, were <clears throat> essential businesses essentially, but they kept investing in their photography and their video. Um, and that, you know, I mean, really saved me (laughs) yeah (laughs) so you were still doing photo work or was this a case where your accounting degree came into yeah (laughs) well no definitely photo work i mean you know during the first few months everything was locked down so just you know pretty much with most other people i was just kind of anxiously waiting the reopening and things to get back to normal whatever that is um but unfortunately uh you know, when I first started shooting, uh, 2006 or so, I actually shot a lot of real estate and, uh, I kind of pivoted away from it as my career grew, but during COVID I pivoted back to it because real estate was deemed an essential service. Um, and more than ever, realtors needed services that could showcase properties without having to bring their, uh, prospective customers in to look at the property. So virtual tours are really big, drone, uh, still photos. So all of that uh, was kind of, I guess, my savior. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I mean, in, you know, in Southern California, real estate market's always kind of booming. So yeah. there's always business and um, they're good paydays, you know, when you're going in and doing photo and video and drone work. Um, so that, that really saved me. Um, and then I also teach photography uh, my classes in person were were shuttered, obviously, but I was able to pivot those online. And um, yeah, so between those two things and, uh, you know, a little bit of side hustle in my marketing company, um, I was able to to stay afloat. That's great, man. That's awesome to hear. I know we talked maybe once, maybe twice during the pandemic and, you know, I knew it, it was hard on you. And, and the thing that's interesting to me is that you've managed to f- stay afloat. And uh, to me, a lot of the stuff you do, at least my understanding of it is um, related to being around people, you know, even the corporate stuff, you're working with bigger teams, you have the photo expeditions, which are obviously all about taking people out to travel you do the, do you, were you still doing the photography club in uh, South Bay? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So like all that stuff just wasn't, wasn't there anymore. Right. Did it change your perspective on photography and, and re- make you reassess like your love for it at all or your appreciation? Uh, yeah, I definitely second guess, you know, my career move and where I was at and, um, you know, but like I said, I, I, I was able to work through the pandemic. So uh, business was like reduced quite a bit, right? I mean, I, I definitely saw a drop off in my overall gross revenue, um, but it was enough to keep me afloat. And uh, like many business owners, you know, I applied for the federal programs, the PPP and the EIDL, and those came through. Um, so those were big, big helps as well. 
Uh, fortunately, I, I don't carry a lot of debt. So, you know, that that really helped too, right? I didn't have massive payments. Um, I, I operate my business pretty lean. Um, I don't have a ton of overhead. So, you know, it's uh, thankful for that during that time. It, you know, it's always been kind of a, a life goal of mine to have a, a physical brick and mortar studio. But and I got to tell you, during the pandemic, I was... <laughs> counting my blessings that I didn't have that overhead to, to sustain. So, um, yeah, you know, I think as a solopreneur, as a small business owner, when you can keep your cost down and your revenue is still coming in, um, that really helps. And fortunately I had a really good Q1 of 2020, uh, so that I had money in the bank. So, you know, aside from just, you know, frugal spending and, and saving money and, um, you know, the business that was coming in, I was able to, to survive. And, you know, it's I, I actually 2020 ended up being a pretty amazing year for me all in all. Um, I also teach photography at the Los Angeles Center of Photography. They asked me to teach more courses. And so I started teaching, uh, I think I teach four, four courses now there. Uh, they made me a, a mentor, a master photographer. So what? that's awesome. Congrats, yeah. Yeah. Man. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's um, so, you know, I mean, I worked hard to get where I am and uh, while I may have had some self doubt and questioning my decision-making uh, in my career, um, it didn't last long. Um, you know, I've been at it a long time. I put a lot of work, a lot of effort in, uh, to growing my business. And thankfully, you know, I was able to, to survive the pandemic and, um, you know, make it through and, and not, you know, I don't want to say thrive, but I definitely took the negatives that were in my face and things that I was facing as a business owner and said, okay, well, I can't control that. What can I can control? Yeah. And, you know, what I found was that, you know, people still want to learn. Online learning is bigger than ever. Um, so that was kind of awesome because there were people in my classes, taking my classes, doing one-on-one classes, doing group classes, um, all online. So, you know, that, that, that really was awesome. And, um, I'm extremely grateful for, for that. Yeah, it it was tough. It was was definitely scary. It was a few scary months in there and, you know, your whole world kind of comes crumbling down and I'm just like, shit, what am I going to do? Um, but you know, I, I, I made a decision pretty early on that I wasn't going to sit there and stress about it um, because it doesn't really, it just, you know, it impacts your, your life in a negative way, right? You just sit and stress about things that you can't really control. So I just focused on what I could control and I just kind of doubled down on that and, you know, it all worked out. Dude, that's, uh, that's funny you say that. I mean, I had, I have just listened to our first conversation. Um, and you know, we covered some ground there that I kind of, I want to keep sacred to that first episode. I want to cover new ground with you. And I would highly recommend anyone listening who's maybe just becoming familiar with you to go check out that story, which is a really inspiring story about your relationship with your mother coming to photography. Um, but in that conversation, you said something like early on, I made a pact with myself that I wasn't going to become, let myself become a victim. And it seems like that mentality has served you well and almost become like second nature in a way. Is that accurate? Yeah, a hundred percent. Um, it's funny. I was just, uh, up in black rock desert for 4th of July and having a very similar conversation with someone that was really struggling with their life and pointing a lot of fingers and, uh, in a very kind way, I just asked them to change their change the lens that they're looking through. And, you know, it's, gosh, it's really easy to point figures at the world and everything around you that, that impacts your life. And we all have these negative things or what at least initially appear as negative things that impact us and how we let those things affect us is, in my opinion, on us. Um, so life's tough. I mean, there's so many angles of life that can just beat you down. And, uh, if that's all one does is just point fingers and not accept responsibility for those things, then, you know, it's, it's easy just to get crushed, you know? And I think it's, it's really our moral obligation as human beings to, to just 
do the best we can with, with, with what we have. And everyone's got a story. Everyone's gone through hardship. Um, but that doesn't, or it shouldn't, you know, shape you. It shouldn't make you who you are. It, it's, 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 I mean, it sounds so cliche, but it's, it's truly like how you overcome these adversities, whatever it is, whether it's life, girls, boys, work, pandemics like it's real easy to get real negative because there's a lot of negative things um but I, I believe you know it's our responsibility to focus on the positive and and to to rise above and i, I believe that we all have that in us it's just you got to dig a little deeper and sometimes you have to look in the mirror and it's not always pleasant um but at the end of the day it's you got to answer to yourself and uh for me it, you know just not being a victim no matter what's thrown at me is is really important so yeah i, I would 100 percent say that, that still remains the truth for me <laughs> that's awesome that's i loved hearing that right away my ears just went whoa <laughs> sick that's like a word for word almost but just a different context yeah um, i would definitely say it's a core ethos for me you yeah. know I've been, I've been through a lot of adversity in my life and um you know it would have been easy for me to to accept it as as fate and that was my future and but I, I wanted to challenge that. And, you know, it's the other day, it's like, you're going to be somewhere in five years where, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, what it's up yeah. to you. So, um, yeah, for sure. It's like, is that thing going to define you or are you going to define it? Are you going to write the story to make that part of who you want? Like, I don't, I kind of messed up that last part. I should have stopped after the define it thing. I think that nailed it. <laughs> No, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, in the pandemic is early on, I was having a conversation with a friend and it's like, you know, there's going to be a lot of innovation and a lot of change in our world as a result of this pandemic. And some people are on Facebook bitching and moaning at each other about masks or whatever. And other people are trying to find solutions and, and change the world for the better. So, you know, I think if, if more people were in that latter group, um, we'd all be better off. But yeah, it's a personal choice, right? Like, um, it probably won't be the last pandemic, <laughs> unfortunately, in our lives. You know, we'll probably have to face something like it again at some point. And uh, yeah, you just got to dig deep and, you know, just go all in. You know, it's, um, it's scary, but, you know, especially for someone like me who likes to control things, you know, <laughs> like, I, I'm a bit of a control freak and, uh, you know, it's just that realization that there's a lot of things in life that you can't control. So yeah. what can you control? Right. So it's, for me, it's just working harder, trying to innovate in my own space. Um, you know, and just doing what I can to survive and, and, and thrive, you know? Yeah. Where does that sense of resiliency or that ability to be resilient in you come from? Cause I know <sighs> for me, and let me talk about me for a second. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but for me, that I kind of, um, I'm still not super resilient. There's a lot of things like I'm going through a work relationship right now that is actually causing me a lot of stress. And I needed a friend to kind of bring me up out of that and say, you know, you need to switch your mindset on this and be more grateful for the things you got out of it and not uh, resentful for the things you didn't. But, you know, I went through a traumatic experience of my own. I didn't. Um, lose my mother like you did or experience those kind of traumas, but I had my own things going on. And yeah. I think that that created a certain sense, a certain level of resilience in resiliency, resiliency in me. And I think also my mom always did instill in me a spirit of like, you can do whatever you set your mind to. So those two things help. But I wonder, does your resiliency come from your mom or is that a direct result of the events you went through in her life? Yeah, gosh, that's a good question. Um, and my mom was was awesome. She was always super supportive of me. And uh, while she made some bad choices that impacted me negatively uh, towards the end, you know, I I forgave her for me. You know, it's like none of us are perfect, right? So, um, you know, 99% my mom was super supportive. But part of it's just, um, gosh, I, what pops in my head is ego. <laughs> okay. Honestly, yeah, you know, I don't want to be a failure in life. Um, that's a personal choice, right? That's my ego. Like, I, I want to be really good at what I do. Um, and I 
don't want to be a charity case. I don't want to be a pity party. Um, I want to create my life and do what I want to do. So, um, you know, I've been really fortunate to have the support and, you know, it's just like not everyone's dealt the same cards, I guess, you know, but I, throughout my childhood, um, whether it was my mother or other adults around me that were really supportive, I was very fortunate that I always had people in my life that told me I could be whatever I wanted to be. I, there was never anyone that said, Psh, you're not smart enough to do that, or you're not mm -hmm. creative enough to do that. Like, I don't know what that's like. I mean, the only, the only doubt I really had was self doubt. Um, there wasn't anyone in my life that, that really held me down. Um, you know, whether it's my coaches, my teachers, uh, my mother, you know, my mom's boyfriend or whatever it was, you know, I always had support yeah. in my life. And I'm, I think that really adds to it, you know, because I didn't grow up with this mindset of, I can't, it was always, I can, it's just your choice if you want to. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I think, um, I know there's a lot of people that, that, that don't have that or, you know, weren't brought up that way. So, you know, I guess I'm lucky. Yeah. For sure. That's fair. I um, definitely can relate to just the feeling of, you know, cards may be what everyone's going to have at some point in their life, their cards turn on them and they're going to face an adverse event. But there's definitely different starting cards that we all have. And some of us are lucky to have good cards and some of us are lucky to have bad cards. And Yeah. Think, yeah. If I'm honest, like I was born into privilege, you know, white privilege. Um, and, you know, I've embraced it and I'm thankful for it. I don't take advantage of it. Um, you know, and I've just tried to live my life the best possible way for me. And, you know, at the same time, while being selfish and going after my own goals and wishes and wants, um, you know, doing good for others along the way. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's kind of the, connection I was hoping we would get to is I was surprised that you said your ego because you don't come in my interactions with you. You've never <laughs> come across as someone who's driven by their ego. I mean, part of your perspective photo expeditions are giving back to the places you visit. And, you know, in the conversations I've had with you when we met, met at LIB, you were very gracious, very kind, never felt as though you were, you know, showing off or yeah. talking about yourself. So how do you how do you balance those two things and let your ego take you through the difficult times, but not steer you in other situations? Yeah, I, I guess I'm still learning, to be honest. Um, <laughs> yeah. One of my favorite sayings is ego is a motherfucker because um, <laughs> it can really just get in your way. And I, I think, you know, it's it's a good thing and a bad thing. Um, but I was raised to just be humble, not really a bragger or you know, I'm proud of my accomplishments and, you know, I don't have any problem sharing them with people that are inquisitive or asking me questions, but, um, it's never to brag. It's just more of a pride thing. I'm proud of yeah. what I've gone through and, and the way that I've overcome my adversity. And the, the more that I share, the more feedback I get, um, that it's making a difference. Uh, a few months ago, I had a gal I went to high school with write me a Facebook message and basically was like, she was suicidal. She was married, had kids, was getting ready in her life. And then somehow stumbled upon my <laughs> postings and things that I talk about. And, um, you know, she basically said, thank you. It, like, because of your sharing, it, it changed my perspective. I've now found meaning in my life. I'm no longer suicidal. And a lot of it was just because she could relate to some of my pain. And ultimately she felt like she wasn't alone and that, you know, if, if he could do it, I could do it. Right. So, um, I don't know. I, I think ego is a part of us, right? It's just part of our being. And 
I don't really know how to answer the question other than I'm still working on it. Right. There are moments, <laughs> yeah. there are moments where my ego gets in my way. Um, but I, I also think that I'm a very conscious human. Um, I'm very conscious about people around me, the things that I say, how, how I say things, how they may impact others. And I think it just comes with maturity, right? Like the older yeah. you get, you're just more conscious you become and more sensitive you become about how you are in the world and, and what energy you're putting off and what that feels like. Um, so I think, you know, with time just comes maturity. And I think, you know, when I was younger, I, I mean, I don't know that I was really ever an egomaniac, but um, I'm definitely a lot softer now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <Word>. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I definitely can understand that in my own experience of, you know, I'm still definitely driven by my ego. I, I would say, you know, I mentioned that work situation. The thing that's getting me caught up in it is my ego. Cause I'm like, I, I deserve this. Like, yeah. why is this not happening? <laughs> this should happen. And I'm going to just blow up the whole thing because my ego is not being served. And so, yeah. you know, I don't know. I, still working no, on it. I, I don't, you know, it, gosh, it, it's a interesting topic, but uh, you know, it's almost like I, you know, your feelings aren't wrong. You know what I mean? Like you're entitled to them and it doesn't just because they're, you know, but I think it's, it's how you process them and, and, and what you choose to internalize versus what you choose to share. Yeah, I think yeah. that that's part of it too. Right. Cause I, I can tell you, so many different stories about me just wanting to just thrash people <laughs> because I felt like I was being mistreated or taken advantage of or giving too much and giving, getting too little, right. All of those feelings, I think they're all really normal, right? but I think it's just, it, it's how you articulate it and, and, and ultimately like, what's, what's the end goal for you. Right. So, yeah. Yep. Um, That's I, what I, my friend asked me today. He was like, what's the best outcome you would want from this? And Sounds I was like just like, friend. yeah, I was like, oh, wait, everything I just told you I want to do would not get me there. So <laughs> yeah. maybe re rethink this a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's, there's sometimes where it's just, you know, it, like you have to let loose and you have to let your, your, your mind and your consciousness kind of process all of those feelings. And then you'll find like that middle ground. Right. Yeah. You, you seem to me like a very rational human. So <laughs> sometimes, you know, yeah, but like we all explode and we all get upset and angry and we feel taken advantage of, or, you know, the ego gets in the way, but um, you know, I, I think that's all human. I think it's very normal. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it sounds like you, you have a good friend supporting yeah. you and asking you the right questions and, <laughs> Um, yeah, I can't tell you how many times, man, I just wanted to pop my lid, <laughs> just <laughs> go bananas, but you know, it's sometimes I do. I mean, I, you know, I'm human, right? Like, yeah, for sure. Sometimes I get upset and sometimes I'll let it rear, but I, you know, I, I really try hard not to. And, um, a lot of those conversations are just internal, you know, they're just yeah. for me and just a way to process things. Yeah, for sure. I wonder Cause like last time we talked, we got in deep about the meaning of photography to you a little, well, we didn't get as deep as I wanted to. I, I think, I think we could have gone a little deeper and maybe we will today. Um, but we talked about how, you know, your mother passed away tragically and it was her photos that were left behind. And you then decided that you were going to full steam ahead, pursue this photography thing. And I wonder if that like, taking the time to look through photos and to revisit uh, memories and emotions. And that's got to play into your ability to understand what's going on now, right? Where you've had this time to be a purposeful retrospection through photography that then allows you in later moments to kind of tap into that sort of reflection. Is that uh, fair? Yeah. Um, I think that's fair. Uh, obviously, for me, photography is such a powerful medium um, and it can be used for good or bad. Um, but I guess on a deeper level, when whatever it is, when someone experiences something so difficult and so painful, 
and for an extended period of time, right? Like this wasn't just like a one-off thing. This is something that I was dealing with for about six years, um, you know, prior to, to her death. And um, gosh, it just made me really a lot more empathetic as a human. Um, and I don't take things so personally anymore. And if someone's cranky at me or something and I'm like, wait, I didn't do anything. Like, <laughs> yeah. Where is this coming from? Um, I guess my experience has just helped me kind of frame people's behaviors in a different light. Um, usually it's not the thing that's being said. That's really the issue, mm -hmm. right? There's something deeper going on. It could be a, a work issue, a home issue, a relationship issue, a, a money issue, a whatever, like, so, I mean, it, I guess it's getting away from photography, but just like my experience and being a photographer, um, it just made me more empathetic and, and, and much more observant too, right? Like I basically paid to, to be very observant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, whether it's looking at emotion or a pose or lighting, right? Like you just kind of slow down and it's just like, the world moves a little slower when I'm looking through the lens. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's kind of like a learned skill, right? Like I, when I first started, I wouldn't, wasn't nearly as good as it at, at it as I am now. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, photography has just really made me slow down and kind of look a little deeper into everything, yeah. not just like what's physically in front of me. Um, I had a gal sitting in my studio last week and just doing headshots and she had never done a headshot. She was very uncomfortable, very nervous. And like <laughs> there's all these emotions, right. That like she brought with her into my mm -hmm. studio. And as soon as she walked in the door, I was just like, ah, I could, <laughs> I could feel it. Yeah. Um, she was just very nervous and saying weird things and just like, just kind of like so it's just like all right before you even bring out the camera let's chat you know let's let's just get you to calm down a little bit so um yeah I, you know i think photography has definitely helped me um become more relatable and um also more understanding and empathetic yeah that's i really love that and it makes me wish i could redo some of my <laughs> experiences in the past because for me i mean i was Okay, so I was doing a lot of festival filming and that requires you to kind of move quickly. Um, I was working with teams, so I had this kind of, is this getting shot? Is, is this person doing this in the back of my head? And it really, it, I've said this before on the podcast, but it, it, I feel in many ways that kind of the mindset I was in, not only just dealing with my own personal issues and my anxieties and the things that I brought like your client brought my own things to each shoot, yeah. you know, it, it prevented me. There would be festivals where I would get to the end of the weekend and I'd be like, I wasn't even there. I, I have all this footage and I wasn't even there. And yeah. that's such a bummer to walk away with that feeling. And did you ever have those kinds of experiences or has it always just been a very oh. meditative thing for you? No, I pretty much don't shoot festivals anymore for that reason. I, yeah. I really like to be present. And to be honest with you, um, my girlfriend was just giving me shit. Uh, we were up in Black Rock Desert for the fourth, and you know, I just kept moving around all my shit, all my gear. And she's like, "Why do you bring this stuff <laughs> with you?" She's like, "You you barely use it." And it's like, "Well, that's true, right?" I mean, <laughs> yeah. And but it it's there in case I want to use it. But but the truth be told, like there's so many times where I don't pick up my camera, and in amazing locations like that, right? There's all this epic stuff going on around you, but it's like I just want to be present. Um, and when, when I put my camera to my face or, you know, I'm looking at my sticks, flying the drone or whatever, like it, it puts me in a different kind of present mode, right? Like I'm after the shot and it's not even, I don't want to say it's not enjoyable because I absolutely love what I do. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's a time and place like for me, I don't have to shoot everything that's in front of me. Um, sometimes I'm selfish and just want to take it in for what it is. And, and, um, I'm okay with that now. It used to cause me a lot of stress. Like I would feel guilty for not shooting all of these amazing places and things that I'm in, but 
you know, it's like you kind of have to pick and choose your battles. And if my head's always in my camera, I may be creating good content, but that becomes my sole focus of my presence there at that time is, am I getting the best shots? And you're probably, you're a creative, so I'm sure you can relate to this, but it's never good enough, right? You, you, it's like, I could shoot 99% of everything just amazing, but I'll focus on that 1% where I'm like, God, I made a mistake here. I could have done this better. I could have done that better. And it, it like, it just gets exhausting after a while. Right. Yeah. Cause it, it yeah. becomes like this internal competition and, you know, it's like, is this worthy? Is this even, should I post this? Are people going to judge me for it? Like, is yeah. this going to retract from my brand? Um, I mean, all this crazy conversations that go on. So um, I feel you when you say, was I even there? Cause you're just so focused on getting your job done mm-hmm. or getting that shot or getting the epic angle or the right light, and especially with festival work. It's so, you, you don't really have any control over it. You're just kind of like a fly on the wall and it happenstance. You're in the right place at the right time. Um, and so, you know, those are, they're difficult. They're fun shoots, but they're difficult. And, um, yeah. I, so I guess my answer is sometimes I just don't bring the gear out. You know, it's always with me in case I want to use it, but sometimes it's just, I'm, it's just me. I'm just being yeah. there present, not worrying about shooting, capturing it, Instagramming or website content, whatever it is. I imagine that's got just knowing the role photography's played or photos have played in your launch, like uh, directing your career and your life choices that it really started from this m- place of memory. You know, you weren't, it doesn't seem to me as though you were setting out to be a great artist. You were, you wanted to recreate the memories or get more yeah. memories that were left for you. So I imagine that's a difficult balance where it's like this mean, this has so much meaning to me because of the memories, but I need to be here so that I cherish it. And it's, that's gotta be tough. Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's an interesting dichotomy. Um, and in a lot of cases, like I'll take bangers of my friends out in these amazing, but I'm not in the photo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Cause I took it. Yeah. So I'm essentially creating memories for everyone else. I guess myself too. Um, I get to be fair. Uh, like photography was always a very romantic profession to me. It was always like a dream job, even before this stuff happened with my mom. Um, It was a a passion at a young age, using film and and the darkroom. And I shot mostly landscapes and nature because I did a lot of backpacking when when I was a kid with my mom and spent a lot of time outdoors. So, yeah, my, my love for photography started at a young age, but it wasn't really a reality. I didn't know how to capitalize on it. I didn't know how to make a living out of it. I never really thought of myself as an artist, right? I mean, I got a D in photography. Yeah. Um, so like, I didn't really have the most support then. It was just like, I had something I like to do. I felt like I was good at it. I could see the world and, you know, the rule of thirds, like, a, you know, it was just like a certain way that I just saw things that translated well onto a camera. Um, but, you know, when my mom passed away and I was going through her stuff and I came across, came across our family photos, it just stopped me in my tracks. Cause it was just, I just that realization of like, wow, everyone's gone. And these are all I have left. And it was obviously like a really big part of my why it's, it's mm-hmm. why I decided to, to take a chance and, and go try and be a photographer um, but yeah, I mean, I, I guess I never really saw myself as an artist. Um, mm-hmm. if anything, it was like, I didn't even think I could attain artist status, right? Like, cause back then to be an artist meant you were going to fine art school, right? You were mm-hmm. going down a very specific education path. Um, and back then like Brooks Institute of photography was like the bee's knees, um, and it was crazy expensive. There's no way I could have ever afforded it. Um, and I just remember like going through the process a few times. It's like how I can't do this. Like, I don't, I don't have those, the means. Um, 
So, yeah, I never really saw myself as an artist. Um, I, I do love, I, I catch myself saying, like, when someone posts something on Facebook that's like a childhood memory and, you know, there's a photo attached. So I'm like, I used to say, just like, photography is the bomb. Like, it, <laughs> it's the best, man. Because it's yeah. like, you, you know, you're freezing time and you're enabling people to, to take a glimpse into that that time period and there's something about it that's so precious um and you know video even more so you know it's it's like but you can't hold it you can't you can't, hold you can't it. hold it that's can't true but it. it does create a different um nostalgia right because there's some elements that you know namely sound yeah. movement um things that photos don't necessarily capture as well like photos are like just a smack dabs, like a snapshot of time. Whereas video, when you watch old video, it's like you can almost like feel yourself in that experience because um, you have the audio, you have the visuals. Um, so it's different. And I, I love them both. Um, but yeah, super, super powerful mediums. Um, but as far as me, you know, it's, I used to feel a lot of pressure to have to capture everything everywhere I went photos, photos, photos. even if I didn't want to do it, I'd still find myself like pulling my gear out of my bag. Like, all right, I got to do this. I got like, I can't, I can't not do this. And now I'm just like kind of okay with putting everything down. Um, yeah. includes my, includes my phone too. Yeah. Um, and you know, sometimes I, I'm like, man, I, I should have picked up my camera. At least. <laughs> For um, sure, been there. You no, know, but but there's something to be said about being present um, and enjoying that time with the people that you're with versus trying to capture it all. Yeah. Um, you know, it definitely takes you out of that element, and it's just really nice just to be sometimes. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've definitely gotten into plenty of those situations where it'll be friends out and some Airbnb, you know, we, uh, there was a group of us, our COVID crew last year, we went on yep. a few trips and I would always take my camera. There was a couple of times I was like having fun taking photos, but sometimes totally. it, it was like, oh man, I brought this thing. I have to take photos. Like it's <laughs> everyone's, that's like what I'm bringing to the crew, right? Is yeah. I'm the photo guy. And it's just, I don't know. It's, it's not as fun whenever it feels like that. And it's hard to get yeah. good photo photos out of it. It, well, that only, and if like, you know, there's a big difference between taking a snapshot on your phone and, and shooting something as a professional, because, you know, there's an entire workflow that happens after you take that photo. Mm -hmm. um, so it's never just like, right. oh, I'm just going to bang <laughs> off some, some, some snaps. It's like, you know, and it sounds probably trivial to listeners who don't do it, but you know, it's like, you've got to download your content and you got to back it up and then you got to upload your content and your editing software you and then you got to sort go through it. <laughs> you got to sort it through. You got to pick all your selects. And then from there, you got to keep weeding it down until the best of the best, um, you know, shows itself. And then you start editing those photos. And then once you edit them, I mean, it's just like, just listening gotta, to that gives me anxiety, dude. Totally, I, I only totally. take film, film cameras with me when I do this. There you things, go. I'm just That's, like, that's what's up. Yeah, good for you. Yeah. Yeah. But that digital workflow can be a uh just another thing to have to do. And so um sometimes it can just be overwhelming where it's like, you know, it's people always say like, you know, there's kind of like a split, I guess, where people say, do what you love, right? And then there's other people who say, Don't do what you love because you won't love it anymore. <laughs> you know? Um, and uh I love what I do, but it doesn't mean that I want to do it 24 seven. Um, and I, I don't really feel like the historian as much as I used to. Um, okay. I don't feel like a massive. And part of that is because everyone has phones on them. Yeah. And so they can pick up a lot of that slack, you know, and it, I'm not like, they're not publishing it for whatever, you know? So like it, it kind of, in some ways is just like, all right, cool. Like they got this. Like, <laughs> yeah. You know, sure. Send me your photos. <laughs> so actually, like, yeah, my good. girlfriend, like whenever we go on a trip or whatever, I just create like a, a Hightail folder and I'll upload like my four photos and she'll upload her 80. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it, it's awesome because we have it centralized. We can go back and look and, um, you know, it's just nice to have. So, yeah, I think because everyone has these amazing phones and video cameras in their pockets now 
it takes a little bit of that like historian stress off where I feel like I have to capture and document everything. Yeah. Um, usually if I'm busting out my gear on a trip or something with friends, it's, it's, like I'm doing it with mad purpose. Like I'm like I'm going after bangers, right? Like <laughs> yeah. for my birthday, got the sun time. sunset alarm on. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so it's like or I'll go in kind of already knowing, like okay, I'm gonna bring my camera this one time. Yeah. Uh, my birthday last year, we were out in the desert, and I brought off camera lighting. I mean, it was ridiculous. <laughs> we had a we had a onesie party. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, out in the desert, and uh, every, everyone got in their onesies, and we went up <laughs> on this ridge at sunset. And I, you know, I set up all my lights and gear, and and took some amazing photos. But that was the only time I busted out my gear, and you know, I, the whole shoot probably took thirty five minutes. You know what I mean? And um, yeah, so you know, it's it comes out, but it's usually very like specific there's a reason for it. Like there's a shot I really want to get or something I've already conceptualized in my mind. Yeah. Um, I don't really just bring it out and leave it out. Plus I'm, I'm really protective of my gear too. Um, so it's I your just livelihood. It's, that totally. It's, yeah. it's everything. Yeah. So yeah. it's I mean, even just getting it all out is a process. <laughs> like, yeah, like, for sure. So it's, uh, but yeah, you know, it's, um, I still love to shoot, but when I'm just on my personal time, I don't necessarily shoot as much as other photographers may. Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, but it's, it's usually the latter. Yeah. It sounds like you have a deep appreciation for the advent of phone, smartphone cameras and their ability to make photography a little more uh, ubiquitous or wild, widespread. It's and it's not so much about um, one person snapping and cataloging and archiving photos. It's kind of a group effort. Yeah, it's kind of like Korean barbecue, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love to cook, but man, when you're cooking for twelve people and you're in the kitchen just busting your butt and sweating, and everyone's like watching a game or having a laugh, and you're just like, oh, man. I wish we go to some K BBQ and then everyone can cook. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's kind of that same thing. Like um, there's a lot of professionals that just despise digital like cell phone photography. And I'm not one of them. I think it's uh, photos are awesome, you know, and, and the, the quality of the tech that's out there right now is just insane. Um and I think it's a good thing overall. I mean, it's, it's also a bad thing overall for a lot of other reasons, but in the context of spending time with your loved ones and everyone capturing some snaps, I think the, the shame would be if no one ever saw those or if yeah, yeah. they just stayed on the person's phone and were never shared or anything like that. But um yeah, I'm a big fan of of cell phones and what that means for you know people to capture memories and just or even just as a mode of self-expression, right? Like it's I, I truly believe that we're all creative. It's just kind of a, a skill that needs to be nurtured. And when you have something that takes pretty awesome snaps in your pocket, it makes it a lot easier to photograph things and share things. And I mean, I'm constantly amazed when I'm going through my Instagram. It's just like, holy shit, these photos are banging. Um, and a lot of them are taken on cell phones. So yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a cool thing. It's, it, it's pretty neat to see everyone's um, take on photography. Um, yeah. That said, I'm professional. I'm super judgmental, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. right? Like some of it just doesn't cut it. Some of it's like way above the bar. Yeah. Um, I think maybe our... Does it matter though? Does that matter? Subjective, right? I think it yeah. matters to... Like if you're doing it professionally, I think it matters. I think there's a, a level of... <sighs> a level of work that you need to be at consistently but as far as you know the everyday person it doesn't matter at all yeah. um because i'm just like thinking of a grainy low light photo of the funniest moment between two friends and it's a shit photo but it captures that moment versus 
some just standard beautiful sun shot photo that has no significance it's like which one would you rather have right 100 yeah 100 yeah. yeah i think it's all about context yeah for sure um yeah it, it, like i guess what really matters is just the meaning behind it in the moments and if that evokes emotion or brings someone back to that point in time then that's all that truly matters um you know my opinion means very little <laughs> yeah but you'll still have one because you're a photographer <laughs> yeah well you know i mean i yeah i do have one and um i have to be really mindful when i teach my beginner students because a lot of the work they send me is garbage <laughs> and it's it's not i mean so was my work when i first started right like there's mm. always room for improvement but i remember when i first started teaching that specific course like i had to be very mindful of my critique right because that's part of the class is they submit their lessons and then i critique them and send them back to them but I remember, you know, doing the first few on video because they're video critiques. And I was like, man, I got to redo these because <laughs> I just sound like a jerk. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's just because it's like, you know, it's 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 not good enough. You can do better. But then it's like, well, wait a second. You know, you have to remember who you're talking to. Right. They're mm -hmm. not I'm not talking to Ansel Adams. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm not talking to someone who's been shooting professionally for 15 years. They're brand new. They don't know anything. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it is funny, but, um, now when I address my students, it, it's, it's genuinely from a much more, um, positive, right? Like place. It's like, okay, this is great. Good work. You know, maybe consider doing X, Y, Z on your next mm -hmm. batch kind of thing, you know, yeah. but I always say, just keep shooting, just keep shooting, just keep shooting. And I promise the repetition you just get better. Um, but yeah, I, I'm totally judgmental. I'm a, I'm a total photo snob. Um, I know what I like. There's what I like. You know, there's not what I like. Um, there's good work. There's mediocre work. There's work that's not worth looking at. You know, it's yeah. but but the, again, it's it's just at the end of the thing. day, it's like yeah, it's you're just a third party observer yeah. in most cases for sure. And I don't. It's not something that I like spend a ton, ton of time on either, right? <laughs> yeah. Like if I'm just going through my feet. Just I'm like, spending oh, all cool. of COVID lockdown yeah. judging, judging. <laughs> judge, <lockdown>. judge, you're <laughs> horrible. No, <laughs> certainly not. Certainly yeah, not. But yeah, sure. I mean, it's gosh, we're we're judgmental beings, man. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's how we got to where we are, right? It was judging, 100%. judging yep. good and bad for sure. Yep. Well, you put things in a box so you can move on, right? Yeah. Because yeah. Just, there's so many things that are thrown at you on a daily basis that if you didn't judge everything and put it in a box and move on, you'd just be stuck on this one thing forever. And yeah, that doesn't lend itself to innovation or progress. No, we'd still be trying to make a make a fire with wet sticks. Totally. Yeah. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. So no, but yeah, it, I mean. Gosh, it, photography is my life. <laughs> I love yeah. it. So yeah. it, it, it is very much all consuming, even if I don't have a, a camera in my hand. Um, oftentimes now I just find myself like like helping people. Like I'll see them take a photo and be like, oh, let me see it. And then I'm like, oh, try this, you know? And then yeah. I'll be like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much. So it, now it's more of like a helping hand. Right. Um, and, and, you know, people appreciate it usually. How do you how do you guide your students or friends who ask for advice who are just starting off to get started? Like what should they be shooting? Cause I know you said you got started in real estate, but me looking from the outside, correct me if I'm wrong. You're seems like you're more interested in experiences in mo in moments that aren't present in a real estate shoot. Right. So how did you, yeah. how did you develop that love? How did you figure out what you liked and what recommendations do you have for people to find that? love yeah i mean for me it wasn't actually it was the outdoors that's what really sparked okay, my okay. interest in photography it was backpacking that's back right? like before high school but like yeah early, like early right days. high school um as a young man that's just what, what i did what we did as a family we spent a lot of time in the woods backpacking and being outside so this is constantly a barrage of like nature and just this amazing landscapes and so that's that's what I started shooting was landscape photography. Um, real estate was just a means like to make money. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, That's the accounting and, accounting brain in there. Yeah. <laughs> well, but there is something for me that I enjoy about shooting real estate, especially high end real estate, because um, it's gorgeous. Yeah. And it's always a challenge. You know, shooting real estate is very challenging. It's very challenging work, and you don't really think about it. But um, there's some nice things like people move and they have attitudes and right. So it's like, depending on what kind of work you're doing, if it's events or portraiture, they have they each, every kind of subsect or specialty of photography has its challenges. Um, real estate was just a way for me to make money um, in the very, very early days of my career back in 2006. Um, but to your question, my advice is shoot what you love right? Because that'll be the easiest thing to shoot. Like if you don't love real estate, don't shoot real estate. Yeah. Uh, if you love skateboarding, shoot skateboarding. If you love surfing, shoot surfing. If you love, you know, hot chicks, shoot hot chicks, whatever <laughs> it is, like yeah. whatever it is that you're truly passionate about um, that you have like that interest in is probably where you should point your camera because it's just easier. There's, it's like you have a, a natural, uh, inquisitive nature about that discovery that exploration of whatever that subject is so um yeah i i wouldn't necessarily recommend that people go about being a professional the way that i did um because it was kind of backwards but um you know it took me a while to kind of figure out what i really like to shoot um you know and i still love to shoot nature but it's so saturated and even was way back then um, that I always kind of knew in the back of my mind that like that wasn't going to be where I made a living. Um, I, I still do it. Um, and it's, it's, it's a majority of my travel work is landscapes, cityscapes, things like that. But um, they're more passion projects than anything. I don't really capitalize on it very much. My bread and butter is commercial photography um, and then teaching and then running my trips. But um, yeah, I, I'd say for anyone that's just looking to get started, it's just, uh, it's one of the things I always ask my students is like, well, what are you into? Like, do you like food? Do you like landscapes? Do you like sunsets? Right. Cause I mean, there's a whole, there's like thousands of Instagram channels just to like dedicated to sunsets and for sure. Most established photographers are just like, Oh my God, really another sunset <laughs> photo. And I still love shooting sunsets cause light color changes always different. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fascinated with, with the environment and the earth and weather, things like that. Um, yeah. but yeah, I just shoot what you like, right. If it's your friends, if it's your dog, if it's your desserts, right. Like <laughs> I know people get really annoyed at food photographers. Like, Oh, oh my I, gosh. Love, I love food photography. Yeah, I do too. Um, <laughs> I've shot food all around the world. It's awesome. And you get to eat it after. So, yeah. um, usually, but yeah, so I think just shooting whatever you like, right? And that's that's all that matters. Um, you know, I, I went a very roundabout way. I just kind of shot everything until I kind of found a home. <laughs> yeah. Why do you? So it sounds like you would say that shooting what you like works because you already have a natural curiosity about it, right? And your your familiarity or curiosity with the topic allows you because you know getting good photos is a lot about finding a unique perspective to see something from or finding a unique sure. way to show an event a moment uh, an angle so it, would you say that that like shooting what you like works because it you already have that ability or desire to see things from a round more well-rounded way yeah I Yes. And I think, you know, it's, what's that saying? Uh, do what you love. You never work a day in your life or whatever. Um, no matter what you do, if it's photography or whatever, I think if you're just constantly chasing the dollar, you're just going to kind of not really stick to anything. You're just going to constantly be chasing the next rat trap. Um, and I think that that's, that's a dangerous cycle to get into. And so, right. Like, um, when I mentor folks, it's like, if you could do anything, right. What would you do? 
And, and I mean that with, without getting paid, like, what do you do anyways? Right? Like, what do you love to do that no one pays you for? And that's typically the answer to everything, right? It, it's that because you're doing it without any form of compensation. You're doing it because it fulfills you, because you like it, because it interests you. Um, and to me, that's the key to success. It's not just chasing dollars, right? Because it just doesn't work that way. I mean, you can chase dollars and they'll probably, you'll find those dollars, but <laughs> you're probably going to get really burnt out and you're not going to, you know, you're not in it for the right reasons. You're just doing mm. it to chase a buck. Right. And in my opinion, the only way to do really great, great work is to do it simply because you love to do it. Mm. Um, not because you're chasing a dollar. Um, Cause chances are most people aren't going to pay you what you're worth anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think for anyone starting out, the reason I say just shoot what you like is because that's, if that's what your passion is, no matter how odd or strange or normal it is, if that's what you truly love to do, then that's what you should be doing. Um, and I am a believer that if you keep doing that, the money will come, people will take notice because you're going to approach the subject in a different way. Um, you'll be essentially become a master at shooting that one thing. Um, and it's, you know, that's really, I think the most successful photographers have understand that they they're, they're doing it the way that they want to do it, regardless of the compensation. Um, and that's very romantic because it's difficult to pay your bills with fantasy and passion. Um, so, you know, sometimes you might have to do three other things on the side while you still keep doing this thing that you love to do. Um, you know, I was watching Quentin Tarantino on Joe Rogan podcast and he pretty much said the same thing, right? Like he just did it because he loved it. He didn't do it because he, in his mind, no one was going to ever pay him for any of it. Cause he's just like, I, what, you know, but I'm, this is what he loved to do. And now he's Quentin Tarantino. Like everybody, yeah. <laughs> everybody knows who the guy is. So yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's so cliche and you hear it so much, especially in small business, um, podcasts and coaching and it's just do what you love, do what you love, do what you love. And it's like, well, how do I pay the bills? And it's like, well, you might not, yeah. and you might not ever, but that's not the point. Um, if you're doing it solely for the money, um, you know, chances are, you know, you're not living up to your full potential. You're not doing mm -hmm. what you need to be doing. Um, yeah. so yeah, I'm glad, uh, I was starting to get a little nervous there. Cause I, uh, I'm, I, I, I do the podcast, you know, I'm not making, I haven't made a dollar off it. I've been doing it for almost two years now. I'm doing it cause I just love it and it's fun and it gets to me to speak to people I look up to or just like want to chat with. And I'm able to use some of my video skills and stuff, but I have started some projects on the side that are strictly for the dollars and strictly as like this, what I hope to be become a supportive sort of mechanism or foundation for me to allow to, for, uh, to allow me to pursue things like this and to spend two days working on an animation summary of a podcast just because I'm like, fuck yeah, this is, sick, yeah, you know, it's awesome. so it's like, I feel like, I feel like that's chill. That's pretty chill. <laughs> I'm a, yeah, no, it is. And I, I'm a big believer of, I mean, look, I, I've started lots of things because of money, right. To chase a dollar, to make a living. And that's the reality. We all have to make a living. So my advice and what I've done that's worked for me is everything that I do, there's crossover, right. It's not like I'm selling insurance and Rolexes and right. Like everything that I do is massive overlap. Um, and that keeps me inspired, but it's also really relevant because everything's kind of pointed in the same direction. Mm. Um, and so and it makes you, yeah, it makes you super unique. Like that, that's a defining it, thing. Yeah. It sure. becomes part of your brand. I mean, I have clients that hire me for photo video and marketing. Right. Um, and some element of business coaching in there because that's kind of all my backgrounds melded into one. 
And that's essentially like one of my core offerings is that, you know, I can help you with your content creation. I can help you with your storytelling and then I can help you leverage it to make money. Right. And that's powerful. Um, you know, I, I teach a class called Photography for Social Change at uh, Los Angeles Center of Photography. And we spend a couple hours on content marketing. And my students are like, what the? Like, you're supposed to be teaching me about how to make the world a better place through visual storytelling. And I was like, but I am. Right. Because, you know, tying it all back to it real quick is, is that in order to stay relevant as a content creator, or a photographer, videographer, like how many times has someone hired you one time for a project, right? And then they never hire you again because they're like, we got our project or we got our, we got our piece, but they didn't know how to leverage it properly. And it just sat on the hard drive and they didn't understand the actual value of your service, right? So wouldn't it be amazing if as the content creator, you could go in there and help educate them like, hey, do you know you can take this one long form and make 55 pieces of micro content out of it? And that you can drip that through an automation, right? And drive it back to sales funnels and things like that. And it's like, what? Right? Like initially they're just hiring you for that highlight reel. I need to take some notes here real quick. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's, 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 I truly believe that if you understand why you're doing what you're doing, and especially in this case for me working with businesses, if you can help them understand that, hey, it's more than a photo, it's more than a video. You can repurpose this, right? And here's a bunch of different ways how you can do that. The more you understand their end goals, the better you can serve your client. And as, as, a, as a creator that works primarily with businesses, that's really important to me. I need to know what they need so that I can actually serve them and they'll keep hiring me. Otherwise, it's like a one and done deal, right? It's like, oh, thanks for the video piece. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you're charging, you know, what I charge is expensive. So that becomes another like, well, we just paid you $6,000 and we didn't really get anything out of it. And it's like, whoa, whose fault is that? It's not mine, right? It's yours because you didn't understand how to leverage it. So let's revisit it. Let's talk about it. What didn't you do? Here are some examples of how you could have repurposed that one piece of content 60 different ways and published one new post a week for an entire year. Now, right, you're that $6,000 expense, you amortize that over 12 months, it's five. It's $500 a month. It's nothing, right? So it, it's, it's, it's important and going back to, so everything that I do has massive crossover. It doesn't mean that I'm any less of a photographer or any less of a videographer. It just means I bring more to the table than most of my competitors because they're just looking to create content and that's it. It's like, okay, here. And then they're constantly chasing clients because they're like, I need more work, I need more work, I need more work, I need more work. It's like, well, what if you could get on retainer every year, right? With, with 10 clients, right? And make six grand a year, 60 grand, right? Just from 10 clients. So that's the way that I see my business. And so everything that I do, there is overlap. Um, so, I don't want to discourage anybody from doing a side hustle. What I would encourage them to do is find something that has synergy with your core strengths, right? You know, with you, animation, podcast, you're an awesome videographer, right? And so if you can meld those three things in together, to me, that's a winning recipe. Yeah. And I've uh, picked up SEO skills at my job that I'll be leaving. And I'm yeah. just like sitting here, this, this podcast all of a sudden just became like a talk to me of like, oh, <laughs> this is what I need to do. He's right. He's right. No, because if you can show more value to your clients, they'll love you even more and they'll keep hiring you because you're, you're doing more than just creating a video, right? You're, you're, you're creating a video that's in alignment with their marketing and sales goals, right? And then you can help them repurpose that content over and over and over and over and over and over again. Like, I think Gary V is probably like the king of micro content. Like, I mean, that guy just smashes content in general, but, and I know a lot of people are turned off by him, but the fact is, is like the guy figured out a formula where he's able to take bigger pieces of content and make it super micro and impactful and relevant. And what that does is it just, it helps the business owner because they're not constantly shelling out money 
right? They're like, wait a second, there's other ways that we can do this. Right. Um, and I think that's really powerful. So if you can make yourself more relevant to your customers, at least in my context for businesses, then it, it just gives you a, a competitive advantage that you know a lot of people in the space, I don't think really truly grasp. Yeah. I love that. And that it reminds me of something I've heard Brett Weinstein say before. I don't know if you're familiar with him at all. Um, he's a evolutionary biologist who has a podcast that I'm a, a big fan of, um, called dark horse, but he, he's always like the world doesn't need more biologists. It doesn't need more physicists. It needs more, uh, biophysicists. He's like, take two things, combine them together and bring some unique insight into the world. And so, I see what you're saying from like a personal practical perspective, but then there's also just a wider application of that idea of taking two specializations and combining them into something brand new that you can not only uh, advance your life forward, but maybe even push things forward for people around you. No doubt. hundred percent. Yeah. I think uh, the more value you can offer, you know, the world, the better the world is. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I, I truly believe that, you know, we're all good at multiple things. It's just putting them together and that's your X factor, right? It's finding those three things that are somewhat complementary, And if you can find a way to put it in one offering, whatever that is, I think that's, that's a really powerful solution. And I think people will take notice, you know, it's, um, so yeah, it's leverage the skills that you have, keep developing, you know, the skills that you want, keep mastering your craft. But, um, you know, I'm really passionate about a couple of things and I integrate them very well into my business. Nice. I do want to wrap up with maybe just some forecasting of what your organization perspective is doing is up to. Um, you guys have done trips to places like Kilimanjaro, um, to climb and do photo expeditions, India for motorcycle riding. I think you were talking about going to Russia, but that was yep. before the pandemic. Yeah. Um, is there anything on the docket? Is there, if someone's just like listening right now, like, Ooh, this sounds interesting. What do you got coming up? Yeah. So, uh, COVID shuttered everything, especially on the perspective front. Um, so we've kind of hit the brakes. Uh, Tanzania in fact has been open pretty much through the pandemic, but just, uh, we felt like it was the right thing to do to just pump the brakes and just wait. Um, so we're currently gearing up for uh, Tanzania in February of 2022. We've got some interest, people are itching to get out and experiences and things like that. Um, we were supposed to be in Ladakh, which is in the, the Kashmir, Northern India, Himalayas on a ride that got postponed. India is having a tough time with uh, COVID. And Sri Lanka was on the books as well. That got pushed. Um, so 2022, we'll probably have only have a couple of offerings. Um, Tanzania being one of them. And uh, hopefully back in India uh, in the early, you know, May, June time. Um, other than that, you know, I kind of just took a break. I'm actually creating a new platform um, called Creatives for Change. And that's kind of a basically an extension of my teaching of photography for social change and my outward bound trips and perspectives. So um, I would probably don't have time to talk about it, but been really excited about it. I've been wanting to take this concept and this kind of program that I've been building and, and creating and teaching um, out to the masses. So we're going to put it uh, currently working on it's kind of a hybrid of online learning meets like volunteer marketplace. Oh, cool. Um, so I'm really excited for that. We're a little bit behind schedule on the launch, um, but it's going to, it'll get launched this year. And uh, through that, we'll be doing um, a couple of annual big trips with perspective and uh, I'm pleased to, we're real close in forming a partnership with a very large concierge tour company. Nice. And they'll actually be handling all of the mundane bookings and stuff. 
because it's not like I'm not a tour guide. I mean, like, I mean, I guess I am, but that's not really my core competency. So I'll be handling off a lot of the admin stuff to them. And we'll just be running the trips and going to big places. But yeah, we just kind of, I put the brakes on it, man, because it's the world is, you know, we're, the US is very like far ahead of most of the rest of the world in terms of vaccinations and access, you know, so um, just kind of pump the brakes on it. But there'll be a couple trips, namely uh, Tanzania and India. Um, I don't know if we'll be doing, uh, I wanted to do Myanmar in January, but that's a tough, tough country. Always a lot of friction going on there. Um, so I got to kind of just take a pause and re- rethink whether or not I, I want to bring people there at this time. Um, but yeah, like we'll still be doing, I've got a, a couple of local offerings that, you know, just like in the Sierras. Um, but yeah, just kind of trying to keep it close to home. And I've really been, because I can't travel really much, you know, without jumping through massive hoops. Um, and I, a lot of my clients are international as well. So it makes it even more challenging because of their, their restrictions. So, uh, yeah, like we will have a couple of offerings in 2022, but I think 2023 will probably kind of re, you know, get back into it and hopefully get back out there. But, um, yeah, Russia is definitely on my list. I actually just have a friend that just did it a few weeks ago. I was super jealous. <laughs> <laughs> Where in Russia? Um, it's uh, Mount Elbrus. So it's oh, the cool. largest uh, mountain there. It's one of seven summits, but it's uh, it's basically a, a trek up and uh, uh, you can ski or or board down. So you don't nice. have to walk down. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's tight. So Different uh, than Kilimanjaro. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Walking down is always the hardest part for me, man. My knees yeah. are shot. <laughs> Um, but yeah, we're, we're going to get back into it. Um, I just wanted to, you know, put it on the shelf cause it was just travel wasn't really a thing. And now that it, it's kind of is, but kind of isn't, I'm still yeah. personally not, not a hundred percent comfortable. It's a logistical um, nightmare with, uh, international clients and it is. That and that, I'm actually hoping this partnership pans out so that, uh, you know, they can take some of that stress off of me and I can just focus on what I do. Um, but I'm really excited about the new platform creatives for change. Um, hopefully that'll be launched, you know, by the end of the summer, like I said, I I am a little bit behind, but, uh, you know, the idea is to just match up creatives of various different verticals, um, with nonprofits who need their help. Oh, cool. So it'll be a opportunity for them to learn new skills while also contributing their materials to these nonprofits. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's fun. Uh, nonprofits rely on a lot of volunteerism. Um, yep. and you know, having taught the class now, I guess three years in person, uh, I'm just floored every time I finish the course and the work that the students do, it's, it's so rewarding, um, to see these stories come to life and the visibility that to byproduct of having content creators on site, um, you know, and we're given the opportunity to work with them for months. So it's, it's, they're actually doing real meaningful, impactful work and it's just such a joy. I love it, man. So um, I've really been, you know, at first it was just going to be photographers for social change. And then COVID hit and I just got kind of bummed out about it. And so I put it on the shelf and then I was getting, I just finished a six month class uh, for photographers for social change. And as I was gearing back up into that class, a friend of mine called me and asked me how I was doing. And I told him I was struggling with this and he's been a great accountability partner and like helped me see that what I was trying to do was awesome, but that there was something more to it. Um, and then I realized I had this epiphany that, you know, wait a second. It's like all businesses need all types of creative input, right? It's not just photo. It's not just video. It's not just drone. It's copywriting. It's web development. It's online marketing. It's PR. It's event planning. Like it's, it's insane. 
Um, and so I was like, whoa, wait a second. And then I just like, it just got real big, right? The vision was like super pinhole. And then all of a sudden it was just like, whoa. So if anything, it's, it's a little overwhelming at this point, but the idea is that I'll be, um, you know, I'll have educators come in and teach various verticals um, and an online education and they'll get certified and then matched up with all of our nonprofits on the back end of it. And then they'll have the ability to submit portfolios and work together and tell stories and, um, you know, be creative for, for nonprofits whose missions that they're passionate about serving. Oh yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So, and I think we'll be targeting a slightly older demographic, but um, yeah, a lot of work. It's, it's, it's been a lot of work. Um, but still a lot of work to do. So, I, uh, but I'm excited for when it launches and when it does, I'll let you know, of course. Yeah, please do. That sounds like something I'd love to talk about or just check out on my own for sure. So, yeah, I'm super uh, hyped on it. We've got a, we got a massive buy-in with a lot of nonprofits who I've worked with. And, um, unfortunately COVID really impacted a lot of the nonprofit sector too. Um, I think for my students, I reached out to well over 50 nonprofits this past term and I had about a 20% response rate. So a lot of them were closed, not answering their phones or didn't have anyone internally to help coordinate like a marketing director or, a, you know, anyone that could like essentially like they basically was like, yeah, we'd love your help, but we don't have anyone here that can facilitate it. So it was interesting feedback, but I think now more than ever, the, sorry, the, the world needs, um, the world needs nonprofits, you know, they need that support. There's a lot of um, communities that aren't being heard, that, that aren't having an appropriate voice that, that need support. So, yeah, I think, um, I think it'll be timely. We're getting the request to bring it literally all over the world. I've currently got, uh, five students international different continents that are super hyped and we may be making them ambassadors to spread that you know our mission where they live so oh yeah who knows man <laughs> very it's a big, cool man it's a big project but i'm stoked on it i have no doubt you'll pull it off <laughs> at all <laughs> Oh, well, that's good. Sure. Cause I have my own doubts. <laughs> it's well, another thing, but no, it's, I think it's, it's time. It's, it's the work is super meaningful and very, very well received. So I think it's like it's, a chance to scale the meaning of your creativity to, uh, uh, to scale it. You're scaling. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's literally like, you know, as a business owner, it's, it's, there's only one me, right. There's only so many photos I can take and, if I'm traveling, I'm losing business because I'm not here or I'm not there or whatever. And um, yeah, I'd say I've been really digging deep to try and figure out a way to scale my brain and my business. And <laughs> I tried to scale my photography business, bring in associate photographer. It just didn't work. Um, and it wasn't to say that it doesn't work. I just couldn't get it to work for me. And people are like, I don't want your associate. I want you like, but you're not here. So we got to go with somebody else. And it's like, it's not about the price at that point. It's just like, they want me to shoot. I'm not there. So I can't scale me, but this is, I think something that is 100% scalable. Cause I'm just a, like a little speck in the whole thing. It's just, you know, but the program has been super awesome. It's really rewarding to teach and the feedback from my students has just been incredible so I, it's very fulfilling and um i keep saying when i die this is what i'm going to be remembered for so nice man hopefully we we can make it work <laughs> <laughs> well please let me know if there's anything i can do to help any of my services or whatever i mean i'm just a just a guy who, but i have some things that uh, to, i could contribute awesome, so i yeah. appreciate that yeah for sure i appreciate that 100 i will i'll definitely keep you posted cool well, thanks for listening to the EW podcast. This has been with John D. Russell, and you can find him at, is it johndrussell.com? Sure is. We'll put that link in the bio. Cool. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Eve.